the third part of this Atlantic system um, that follows yet another logic is the sales and marketing end, where the plantation goods are sold in Europe in coffee houses. Now consider for a moment what substances are being brought into Europe from the New World. Again, coffee, tobacco, sugar, and coffee, uh, and excuse me, and um, cocoa. Cocoa, of course, being the main substance that goes into the making of chocolate. Now, um, this as, a, as an online class, you know, there is no, um, no public shaming involved in admitting if you have done chocolate uh, privately, you know, you don't have to share this, but uh, you know if you have tried chocolate that it is something you would want to do again. I mean, you know better to, to do it, but there are some people who for parts of their life will eat chocolate on a regular basis because they just can't stop. And um, apparently with tobacco, I wouldn't know anything about that, but with tobacco, it is the same thing. And then sugar, which you can both put into your coffee and also which goes into the chocolate making along with the cocoa, is another such substance that has people coming back for more in spite of having no nutritional value whatsoever. And like cocoa and like tobacco, in fact, making you sick. So there are no health benefits to all of these substances, to any of these substances that are made on the plantation. They all are addictive. They all satisfy a craving which really they create. You didn't know you needed another cup of coffee until you had your first one. You really didn't feel a need to go back for more chocolate until you first tried it. So these foreign substances that are being introduced into Europe have no place and no root in that traditional order. The traditional order was about livelihood. What mattered in consuming, producing, and exchanging things was stuff that clothed, housed, fed, or otherwise was useful to people. None of the stuff that comes off the plantation is strictly needed. Nobody has to have coffee, sugar, or chocolate. And yet that it feels so good. So, um, and it is big business. You can sell this to people and because of the addictiveness, they will come back for more. What you have then is a whole system of production that makes nothing but from a you know, nutritional standpoint, useless and unhealthy things that nonetheless satisfy a craving. So if you haven't figured this out yet, let me, let me make it explicit here. The plantation system produces drugs. It is a huge, it's a humongous drug trade. And it's nothing but that. Um, we're not even talking about cotton yet, where you could say, yes, this is useful. It puts clothing on people. None of that. It is really just, um, a drug trade, addictive, unhealthy substances made at great expense of, of human, you know, great human cost. The only reason there is slavery is to produce these things. Um, and now they're being brought to Europe where people haven't had access to any of them. Only tobacco is strictly new. Tobacco didn't exist in Europe, as you probably know. It's a North American, uh, it's an American plant. Sugar. Cocoa and coffee, on the other hand, come out of Southeast Asia originally and had made their way into the Middle East by the time of the high Europe, European High Middle Ages. <coughs> Excuse me. So they were known and available, but really just to the top crust, to the upper crust, it, they were luxuries. That makes it all the more desirable for everybody to get a taste of this. You know, if you, if you are aware that there is such a thing as coffee, but really nobody can afford it, but the very filthy rich. And if suddenly somebody with access to plantation goods sells you a cup of coffee you can afford, um, that's another selling point. Because 
coffee, tobacco, sugar, and cocoa had had no place in the traditional order. You know, if there was no mass market or anyhow, any, nor any market for these goods, there is no need to have a guild of uh, coffee roasters or a guild of sugar bakers. The introduction of these substances does not affect directly the system of manufacturing that is in place in the crafts. So it exists between the cracks of the old economic order. Um, and in those cracks, it est establishes something revolutionarily new, um, in which we call consumer culture later on with hindsight. That is what it creates. When people think about buying stuff in the traditional order, they think about meeting concrete needs. And you do that by going, say, to buy bread from a bakery in your neighborhood. And by buying bread in the bakery in the neighborhood, you're going to a place that you're familiar with and you're meeting people there who you've known growing up. And all the stores that meet the daily needs, you will find in your neighborhood in the small town and even in the big city. Not just that, you also know that the bread is made from grain that um, comes from villages where you might have seen the farmers come into town with their carts, or at the minimum, you have a vague idea in what province of the country the villages are located that grow the grain that makes your bread. So um, it is very concrete. Nobody has a mental picture of what a plantation looks like, on the other hand. This is also, this is exotic. You have a vague idea that there is America out there. You might like to see it one day, although it is highly unlikely unless you are a sailor or a soldier. So um, one way, however, of getting a taste of this exciting new world is to drink a cup of coffee, to eat a little piece of chocolate, to smoke a tobacco pipe. So that's one selling point as well. And because while the market for these goods is more of a mass market, it is nonetheless not possible for the average person to afford more than one cup of coffee and a small piece of chocolate, say, once a month. So you wouldn't be able to sustain a coffee shop, a coffee house, where you can buy all these things in every neighborhood of a big city or in every small town. Meaning that if you want a cup of coffee, you have to venture outside of your comfort zone. You are no longer in your neighborhood where you know everybody, you're going someplace else. And not only are you getting contact with substances you haven't tried or haven't had much exposure to, but you're doing these substances with people you've never met, who may be from totally different walks of life. Um, if you are, and this is, this again, this too is a novelty and it is one way in which traditional society changes and dissolves. Um, it, it opens up. Another factor that is new in the coffeehouse culture that emerges is advertising. If there are multiple coffee houses in a big city like London or Amsterdam, and um, neither of them serves just one specific neighborhood, there starts to be competition between these different coffee houses. And to gain an edge on the, com on the competitors, you might want to advertise. So this is also the birth of advertising as a way to create and cater to artificial needs and desires. How does advertising at the time work? Well, first, of course, you have store signs that people put up. Nobody needs to put a sign above the entrance to a bakery because people know that's where the bakery is and it smells like bread. But with the coffee house, you start seeing store signs or these large carved figures of Native Americans that you can still see in some places on the roadside being sold even today, smoking a pipe and such like. But more common uh, is the use of trading cards, meaning that when you go and buy 
coffee or tobacco at a coffee house, you get a trading card that on the one side lists the name and address of the store and a slogan, only the finest Virginia tobaccos, visit Miller's on Baker Street. And if you flip it over, you have engravings. And this is the age where lithography becomes commercially available as a method of, of re reproducing relatively detailed images in, in, on small scale in mass printing. And these lithographized images show scenes in the new world of an idealized plantation, of an idealized America, um, appealing not to any kind of you know, wish to know the reality of the plantation, but rather to imagine how, um, how exotic it would be to be in, in such a place. One of my favorite examples of a trading card as an advertising tool for a coffee shop in England shows um, a new world scene, a beach with a palm tree, in the background tobacco plants. So this is a plantation setting in the new world. Against the palm tree in the center of the image is leaning the white plantation owner smoking his pipe. To his left and right are seated lounging on the floor in a leisurely pose. Um, on one side, a Native American with an elaborate feather headdress. On the other side, an African. Both of them, too, are smoking their pipes. It presents a picture of leisure, harmony between these three groups, black, native, and white, European, and it thereby paints an entirely unrealistic, almost offensive picture of the plantation, which, if you know anything about that labor system, really is not all that harmonious and certainly not equal uh, between these groups. So, willfully, the plantation uh, system is misrepresented, is made to look a whole lot more harmonious and harmless uh, in the advertising here. So just as from the beginning, advertising paints a false picture, creates a false consciousness of the world. Um, although to some extent, you can still say people in Europe are blissfully unaware of the realities of slavery, Although, of course, people like Olauda Equiano, who writes a book about his experience as a slave, are working hard to change that. So fewer people will be able later on to say, well, we just didn't know how bad it was. Eventually, you know, by, by the late 1700s, people do know. So the coffee house for the history of Europe has a major beneficial effect on creating a sense of freedom and possibility, equality and public space, public debate. Um, I mentioned it's a drug culture. And on the plus side, on the positive side of this, apart from the harm to your health and um, all that, <coughs> one of the reasons, of course, people do drugs like tobacco, uh, coffee and chocolate is that it expands the mind. It changes the way that the brain functions, at least for a time. So they are mind altering substances. And one way in which the minds of Europeans are altered in the 18th century is to think much more in terms of individual rights. The right to, um, as the Declaration of Independence says, life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. The right, maybe, to make up your own mind about your faith, to choose your own religion. The right, perhaps, to have an opinion about the actions of your government, to eventually even to be asked when the government makes major decisions, like whom to go to war with, for instance, or whether at all to go to war. So all these things that we associate with the age of revolution, the ethos that informs the making of the constitutions and the revolutions in America and in France have their origins in the coffee house. It is in that sense, um, and 
you can sort of imagine why. It's not just about the drugs. It's also about that, um, that spirit of equality, of getting people out of their comfort zones and mixing up people from different walks of life that creates a society out of these people um, where people from different professional and religious backgrounds suddenly find that they have something to talk about, that they have something in common that maybe they have more in common with each other than they do with the king and with the nobility and with the clergy. So here you have the nucleus in the coffee house as people sit there and drink their coffee, as they spend a lot of time sitting there because the coffee is so expensive, you really want to sever it with a lot of people they don't know and with access to newspapers, again with those lithographed images in them that open up a world of exploration and discoveries and philosophical thought and news about politics and so forth that people discuss and read out loud to each other in these coffee houses. So this in a nutshell on a small scale is the ideal of a democratic public sphere as we know it. People come together in an open-ended discussion, they make arguments, they listen to different points of view, and nobody is in charge, nobody is the boss, nobody gets to stop the discussion, redirect it, it's more or less a free-for-all. And people learn from that experience that they are capable of understanding and of forming opinions about things that they had been told is are none of their business. It's just an affair of state. The nobility and the king get to know these things and get to make these decisions. The clergy, the pope, the ministers, the bishops, etc. And in the coffee house, people learn, no, we are actually smart enough to know how to run the government or to form opinions about the Trinity and transubstantiation and whatever other theological problem you might throw at us. So why don't we have the right to voice our opinion and to pursue these angles of thought? So the coffee house is a revolutionary space. And later on, if we look at the actual revolutions, the practice um, of talking politics, of talking rights and so forth in the coffee house makes possible these revolutions. It, it trains a generation of political activists, so to speak. But of course, the irony of this is mm, stark. The coffee house creates a public sphere that nurtures ideas of freedom. It is the place where modern revolutionary ideas in the 18th century of freedom, individual rights, and so forth first emerge and are articulated. And yet, this coffee house would not exist without slavery, which is the most heinous form of unfreedom that is also part of the making of this modern world. So there is a contradiction built into this system where on the one hand you have the a state of utter and abject rightlessness of the slaves on the plantations and yet it is their labor and the stuff that they produce as well as the wealth that they produce through their labor that creates the space where Europeans can start thinking about freedom. So up until this point, we've only talked about how these three different stages of this Atlantic system are disparate. In other words, how they are not connected and they don't sync, they don't function according to the same logic. You have different degrees to which these parts of the system are still traditional, <coughs> already modern, and so forth. So uh, that raises the question, what unites these different stages? Is there anything common at all? What makes this a system? So that is the next uh, issue I want to address in this lecture.